I just realized I have to introduce our next speaker. Sorry, Sinead. So, thank you very much for that. So, our last talk of the first half is uh, Sinead Mitchell Brennan. Sinead is an educator, an educator, I went to school, an educator, researcher and writer from Ballina. She's a graduate of Maynooth University and Trinity College Dublin. Her research focuses on history and heritage of her hometown, in particular the experiences of ordinary people during key moments of Irish history, especially the revolutionary period. She was the educational facilitator at the Jackie Clark Collection from 2016 to 2022. And I have to say, I've spoken to many teachers in schools who love her and their kids loved her. And she's an amazing person, so I'm sure you'll enjoy her talk. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Sinead, thanks very much for coming this evening and thanks to Liam for organising the event and for inviting me and um, I feel very honoured to be here with the three wise men who I really, <laughs> really do admire um, very much and um, thanks to Lisa and Anne-Marie in Banna 23 and the Banna 23 and the lovely staff at the Arts Centre for such a warm welcome. Um, okay, so here we go. So Liam has set the scene and I'm going to bring us right up to 100 years ago, um, 1923 and the year of the Civil War. Okay, so 101 years ago, sorry, 102 years ago this week, on the 11th of July 1921, a truce between Great Britain and Ireland brought 131 weeks of ferocious fighting between the IRA and Cumann Amman and the Crown Forces to an end. The War of Independence, or Tan War, as it was more commonly known, was a conflict which transformed the towns, villages, highways and byways of Ireland, including Ballina, into a bloody battleground. The resolution of one conflict had sowed the seeds for another, paving the way for the most bitter, divisive and defining periods of our recent past, the Irish Civil War of 1922-23. It was a conflict which claimed more lives than the War of Independence and pitted formerly united comrades against one another. This brutal parting of the ways shaped much of the political, social and economic fabric of our nation for generations to come. Much has been written about the Civil War, particularly in, particularly in recent times. New important research has emerged, fresh perspectives have been brought to light, and tentative steps towards reconciliation, reconciliation have been taken. Yet at the heart of the narrative of this dark chapter are ordinary people. And with that in mind, the title of my presentation this evening is Soldiers and Civilians, Forgotten Women of the Civil War in Ballina. And I would like to tell the stories of local women and how they experienced the Civil War firsthand. At the centre of our story are women who had been highly active in the Tan War and whose experience of the Civil War represents that of so many of their fellow compatriots across this town, county and country. I will also include the tragic tale of an innocent civilian whose death reminds us of the cruel, undiscriminating nature of warfare. And I'm going to start with this lady and I'd like to credit Terry for the use of the photograph. And her name is Miss Ida O'Hora, who was described in 1943 by Phelan Caleary TD for North Mayo as the, this lady was the best in the North Mayo Brigade and most active in common a man in the district. Ida was born in 1899 um, to Kate and Michael O'Hora in 1899, the second eldest of four children. She attended school in Banlas Convent of Mercy. The 1911 census, sorry, the 1911 census shows us that Ida's widowed mother, Kate, was head of household and proprietress of a small grocery shop in Number Three Garden Street. In, eight, in 1911, Ida was just 12 years old and she could not have foreseen that in the decade that followed, she would be at the centre of an unprecedented period in Irish history which played out in the most dramatic fashion on the streets of our town. In 1918, at the age of just 19, she set up the Banlar branch of Cumann Amman, the women's organ of the Irish volunteers which pledged to support, fund and ultimately fight for Irish freedom. She was the president of the Banlar branch which had a membership of between 70 and 100 at any given time. She said about recruiting, organising and ensuring that branches soon sprung up in other areas such as Rehens, Clahans and Bunny Condon. Ida rose to the position of OC of the District Council. Those early days were dedicated to drilling, parading and learning essential first aid skills. Dances and concerts were put on, an effective means of raising funds to arm the Irish volunteers and support the campaign of the Sinn Féin party in the historic general election of 1918. With the outbreak of the Tan War in 1919, the nature of Ida's activities and responsibilities greatly intensified. By this time, she had taken up employment in Walsh's stationery and tobacconist store on Knox Street, now called Pier Street. She lived nearby on the same street. 
Walsh's shop was soon to become more than just a place of work for Ida. As time went on, the shop fronted as a pick-up and drop-off point for dispatches, intelligence reports, and weapons for various members of the North Mayo Brigade. There was considerable risk involved, consider the proximity of the RIC barracks on Wall Street, now Gumnetical, on Charles Street, now Wall Street, and later the building of the notorious Black and Tans at the Moy Hotel, now the Banla Library, on the same street. Ida regularly stored caches of revolvers and ammunition under some loose floorboards in Walsh's shop. Her home, which doubled as a safe house, was raided on numerous occasions, but as nothing was ever found, Ida continued on in her work undeterred. Half days, evenings, weekends, and every spare moment was spent carrying dispatches all over North Mayo, often accompanied by her younger sister, Flory, who tragically died in 1926 as a result of TB. Another sister, Bertha, was also an active member of Balna branch of Cumanaman. Parcels of clothing, food, and cigarettes were made up and brought to men on the run and members of the local fly flying columns. Raising much needed funds for the prisoner dependence fund was a constant concern and much of that money and provisions were supplied at her own personal expense. She was regularly dispatched to Dublin, entrusted with confidential communique between the local brigade officers and the IRA headquarters. Michael Collins himself was personally known to her. She was entrust a trusted intelligence gatherer and surveyed the movements of the local Crown forces from her vantage point in the town's main thoroughfare. Her reports were regularly put to use, most notably on the night of 21st of July 1920, when a local column carried out a daring ambush on the nightly RIC and auxiliary patrol at Moy Lane. That engagement resulted in the fatal shooting of RIC Sergeant Robert Armstrong. Ida was in a position as scout near the barracks on Charles Street on that fateful night, and it was her job to hide the weapons that were used afterwards. In 1921, Ida found herself at the centre of one of the most shocking events in Banla's War of Independence story, which I'm sure is well known to most of you here, the case of, Welt, of Michael Tolan. A 26-year-old tailor and intelligence officer, he had been born with deformed feet. He was captured by Crown forces on the 4th of April 1921 and held prisoner at the RIC barracks until May. Tolan disappeared and there was no trace of him until the body of a man bearing gunshot and bayonet wounds was discovered at Shaheen Bog near Foxford in June of that year. The victim's feet had been savagely hacked off. Ida, accompanied by her right-hand woman and branch captain, Margaret Maggie Sweeney, Sweeney from Knockanillon, had visited Tolan on several occasions following his arrest and supplied him with clothing, cigarettes, meals, and most importantly, a bit of company for those three weeks of his incarceration. Tolan had suffered a terrible beating at the hands of the Tans. To ease his suffering in that cold prison cell, Ida brought him warm clothes, woolen socks, and a dark green overcoat. This last piece of clothing was to become a key piece of evidence in the inquest into Tolan's murder in November 1921. The description of the coat worn by the victim in the Bogot Raheen matched that of the one supplied by Ida. As one of the last persons to see him alive, her evidence at the inquest, which returned a, a verdict of willful murder at the hands of Crown forces, was pivotal. And here is Tolan's funeral. Um, Balna, Cumann and Man were central to the full military funeral of volunteer Tolan, one of the largest ever witnessed in this town. They formed a large guard of honour reciting the rosary Osquelga, and as the, court, as the cortege moved through the town, and you can't really see it in the photograph, but if you zoom in, if you see where the word one is, if you just kind of move your eyes across there, you'll see a couple of uniformed um, common man women. But unfortunately, it's just too blurry when I blow it up, but they're there. Um, the calling of a truce between Great Britain and Ireland did not signal a return to quiet civilian life for Ida. Herself and Maggie continued organising and recruiting for the common man branches under the remit in the district and even saw the setting up of new branches in Magauna, Cross Malina and Lahardon. Along with the overwhelming majority of her comrades in North Mayo, Ida opposed the Anglo-Irish Treaty and thus took the Republican side in the bitter parting of the ways which followed. She was appointed a Special Intelligence Officer in the IRA, a testament to the high esteem in which she was held by her male comrades in arms. During that tumultuous civil war period, she carried dispatches for the Republican IRA practically every day. She set about procuring much needed weapons and ammunition and even managed to strike a deal with a Free State officer who was stationed in the town to purchase guns and ammunition with her own money. Ida's dangerous espionage work continued as before. The nature of the enemy may have changed, but the risk was certainly as great as ever. Her intelligence reports were a vital component in a key moment in Balanas civil war story and one of the most high profile events of the period in the county, the Republican capture of Balana on the 12th of September, 1922. On that date, a 150-man company of the anti-treaty IRA led by General Michael Kilroy boldly swooped on the town, 
launching a successful surprise attack on the National Army. The aim of the operation was to seize control of the North Mayo stronghold from Free State hands and to secure much needed weapons. However, for two families, the Tynans of Tullamore, County Offaly, and the Cafferties of Bridge Street, Ballina, the 12th of September was a day that brought unspeakable tragedy upon them. It was a day their beloved daughter, sister, niece and cousin was cruelly snatched from them, an innocent civilian casualty of a well-planned and executed military operation. It was the day a bright 21-year-old young woman was struck by a stray bullet killed as she crossed the Hambridge on her way home after Mass in St. Muirdas Cathedral. Her name was Miss Constance Tynan. Constance, or Connie as she was affectionately known, was one of three children born to Delia and Edward J. Tynan of William Street, now Column Kill Street, Tullamore, County Offaly, in 1901. She was the middle child. Her elder sister Florence was born three years previously. A little brother Desmond followed in spring 1903. The Tynans were grocers and publicans operating on the bustling street of Tullamore. With three healthy children and a successful business, the Tynans had so much to be grateful for. Heartbreakingly, just one month after the birth of baby Desmond, Delia Tynan fell ill. She died on the 26th of May 1903, aged 33, and was laid to rest in Clonminch Cemetery. In the years that followed, Edward Tynan, with the help and support of his sister and his late wife's family, raised his three children on William Street. Among the relatives who supported Edward Tynan was Delia's sister, Rosalie. While working in Dublin, Rosalie met a young man who was employed as a draper's assistant. He was a farmer's son from Ballina, and his name was Patrick Cafferty. The couple married in Dublin in 1902 before moving to Ballina's hometown of Ballina, sorry, before moving to Patrick's hometown of Ballina. They set up a drapery shop on Brig Street in the premises more recently known to us as Blooms and Things Flower Shop. Cafferty soon established itself as a popular store which stocked the latest fashions and gave employment to many local people over the years. The Cafferty's endured more than their fair share of troubles. In 1904, a daughter named Pauline died at age one month of convulsions. In 1909, a baby boy called Gerard was born delicate and lived for just eight days. The couple's surviving children were Eileen, born in 1905, and Maureen, born in 1907. A boy, Patrick Jr., was welcomed in 1912. Joy soon turned to grief when Patrick Sr. died of a heart attack, age 52, when his namesake was just three months old. His death came as a huge shock to the people of Ballina. He had been a popular employer merchant and involved in many local activities. Naturally, his loss was most keenly felt by his widow, left to raise the young children and run the family business all on her own. Somehow, Rosalie Cafferty found the strength to rise to the occasion. The Roscommon native earned a reputation as a hard-working and quietly formidable businesswoman held in the highest esteem by the people of Ballina and beyond. All the while, she maintained contact with the Tynan family on William Street, Tullamore. The year 1922, against the backdrop of the Irish Civil War, brought unimaginable tragedy to Rosalie Caffrey's door. In the summer, young Patrick's health fell rapidly into decline, and in July of that year, due to kidney failure, he died. He was buried in the family plot in league alongside his father and two siblings he had never met. He was just 10 years old. It was around that time that Rosalie's niece, Connie Tynan, came to live with the Cafferty family on Bridge Street. It's unclear whether she had been in Ballina before young Patrick's death or if she came afterwards. In any event, she must certainly have been a great source of comfort to her aunt Rosalie in her darkest hour. No doubt teenage sisters Eileen and Maureen were glad of the company of their older sister from Tullamore. On the morning of 12th of December 1922, Connie left her aunt's premises and made the short walk to St. Muirdas Cathedral to attend a requiem mass for the 23-year-old National Army soldier named Lieutenant Patrick Moran of Hill Street, who had been shot as a result of a bullet to the stomach in the preceding days. Large numbers of Free State soldiers had left their posts to attend the service, a fact that was used to maximum advantage by Kilroy and his men. Unbeknownst to Connie Tynan and her fellow churchgoers, a dramatic chain of events had already been put into motion that morning. By the time the service concluded and the sympathisers began to make their way home, General Kilroy, OC of the 4th Western Command, and his men were simultaneously descending on the town. The advance party was led by an armoured car, the Ballina Lee, renamed the Rose of Loch Gill by the IRA when they took possession of it from Free State hands. The imposing vehicle, driven by Sligo native Christy McGlynn, hurtled down Arnery Hill at high speed. In the turret, operating the machine gun, were senior personnel of the North Mayo Brigade, led by PJ Rutledge. The reinforced Rolls-Royce 
mounted the slight incline onto the Ham Bridge, where two Free State soldiers, Private William Green and Private Thomas Slackey of Hill Street, were in position. The pair of young sentries were caught completely off guard. There was a rapid fire of, of exchange of gunfire. Green and Lackey sustained injuries, and the Banali dashed into Bridge Street. There was, however, another person at the Bridge Street end of the Ham Bridge, close to Walsh's saddle and mer leather merchants right at that very moment. Connie Tynan was struck by a stray bullet to the chest. She slumped immediately to the ground and died a short time afterwards. She ne never did make it back to the safety of her Aunt Rosalie shop just a few hundred feet ahead, nor home to Tullamore to her father's warm embrace. Connie's funeral in her hometown brought Tullamore to a standstill. Hundreds of mourners from far and near lined the streets as the cortege made its way from the Church of the Assumption to Clonminch Cemetery, where her mother laid. The local press noted that the funeral was one of the largest seen in the town for many long years. It is 19 years since I first came across the name of Constance Tynan. As a young student of history, I was immediately taken in by the tragic tale of a girl, similar in age to myself, who was killed on the very bridge that I had crossed countless times. She had been all but forgotten. The newspapers of the day recorded little more than the scantest of details. Her faceless name had been lost in many column inches given over to a militaristic telling of the story of 12th of September 1922. As the centenary year of her passing approached, I set about tracing her relatives in Tullamore. Most of all, I hoped finally to bring a photograph of Connie to light. A great many inquiries were made. My search brought me from Ballina to Tullamore, Roscommon, Meath, Westmeath, Dublin, and finally Kilkenny via Portugal. It's an unexpectedly moving experience to see the face of someone who you've had at the back of your mind for almost two decades. I'd never seen her before, yet somehow Connie looked exactly as I had imagined, and strange as this may sound, almost familiar. She wears her dark hair in the fashionable Bob style of the day. Her eyes are deep and thoughtful. She exudes an effortless grace. Connie Tynan is young, and she is forever beautiful. Six months later, on the morning of 1st of March 1923, local IRA Brigade Quartermaster Dennis Sheeran of St. Murdoch's Terrace was captured by Free State soldiers. A search of his pockets revealed a dispatch addressed to Miss Ida O'Hore at Pierce Street. At 11 a.m. her home was raided and she was arrested. Ida's right-hand woman and close friend, Maggie Sweeney, was next to be picked up. When the Free State soldiers burst into Maggie's lodgings in the home of Miss Maher on Convent Terrace, they ransacked her home and even tore up her insurance policy worth 200 pounds and 40 pounds of receipts that she had paid into it right in front of her. The pair were brought to Banla Barracks, the former workhouse, which now stands, St. Joseph's Hospital. They were held there before being transferred to Chew, most likely by Transport Larry, then on to Galway and then Kilmainham Jail. Kilmainham Jail had fallen into disuse, but under the instruction of General Richard Mulcahy, was brought back into use to house what he called suspect <coughs> IRA women. Among the first batch of prisoners was General Mackay's own sister-in-law, Nell Ryan, a vivid example of how the split had divided so many Irish families. The targeting and internment of common man women was a deliberate strategy on the part of the National Army. They were all too aware of how highly organised, disciplined and effective their female comrades were, their former female comrades were, an essential pillar of the Republican movement, not merely an ancillary group, but as active combatants. The Cumann Man Corridor in Kilmainham was located on the top floor of the extension added to accommodate female prisoners in the 1840s. The conditions in the Victorian prison were notoriously ab abysmal. Inmates were forced to share cold, damp, dimly lit, cramped 28 square metre cells with several others. No visitors were allowed, letters were censored, and parcels from home were often intercepted if delivered at all. The Jangle of the Keys is a prison memoir by Margaret Buckley, whose time in Kilmainham overlaps with that of Ida and Maggie. It was published in 1938. Buckley paints a grim picture of the wretched place. It smelled horribly, the cells were placed along narrow corridors, and the passages were stone. The walls were so high as to even shut out the sky, and so grey and forbidding, and not a blade of grass breaks the drab monotony. Insufficient food rations, poor sanitation, frequent searches in the middle of the night, and other tactics deliberately designed to break the morale of the women was the order of the day. That spirit was not so easily broken. The women organised themselves, establishing a prison council and engaged in acts of disobedience, drawing on tactics used by suffragette inmates. Both Ida and Maggie participated in the hunger strike of 1923 in protest to the mass internment without trial of male and female Republican prisoners all over Ireland. In 1923, Ida and Maggie were among a group of 81 prisoners transferred from Kilmainham to North Dublin Union, known as the NDU, a former derelict workhouse. The women of Kilmainham resisted the transfer, fearing of what would become of themselves and those who were left behind, two of whom remained on hunger strike. 
At a time when the Free State had already executed Republican leaders and rank-and-file IRA men, it's difficult to imagine the constant state of terror that must certainly have prevailed among the women. Such was the level of violence experienced on that night of the transfer from Kilmainham to North Southern Union that Dorothy McCardle would refer to the event as the Kilmainham Tortures in an article she wrote in 1923. Dorothy described how the women had gathered on the top landing, linked arms tightly, and began singing aloud and reciting the rosary. They waited. They were rushed by a group of military, military police and CID men who hauled them out with brute force. The women, clinging to the railings on each other, were dragged, kicked, punched, and flung as each one was forced onto a transport lorry. The ordeal lasted five hours. Recounting that night to the Military Pensions Board in 1938, Maggie Sweeney of Knockanillon wrote, the soldiers first fired on us, and then we were dragged down the stairs and ill-treated. I had my arm badly twisted and hurt, and had to wear it in a sling for four or five weeks. My hip and ankle were hurt by kicks from two soldiers. The ankle was swollen and had to be bandaged by the prison doctor. I was lame for six weeks. In her interview to the pensions board, Ida Hoare did not give any details of her time as a Republican attorney alongside Maggie, other than to clarify the dates of her incarceration. Indeed, the interviewer added a note to her file alluding to her modesty, remarking, applicant does not overstate her case, which appears to be a very good one. Perhaps there was more to be gleaned from what Ida left unsaid. The interviewer says, is there anything you wish to say? And Ida says, I do not think so. Today, the archives of Kilmainham Jail Museum are home to a considerable number of prisoner autograph books which have survived from the period. These little booklets contain names, drawings, verses and slogans clear carefully added by the internees. They were a way of passing the time, recording their experiences, and expressing political ideologies. As part of my research, I was generally given access to these materials by the wonderful staff at Kilmainham. Would there be any trace of two Ballina women among these faded pages of history? And sure enough, there they were. Ida Hora and Maggie Sweeney's neat handwriting stare and backing me at from a century old page. There's something very visceral and powerful about seeing their signatures as if their presence is bridging the gap of over 100 years. In 1923, from cell 28, A. Winklemanum Jail, Miss Ida Hora and Miss Margaret M. Sweeney, prisoners 142 and 143, inscribed their names and Ballina addresses in the autograph book of Kitty Coyle. There's a hint of dark humour too. The girls had wryly renamed their cramp cell Ballina House. In June 1923, from her cell in the North Dublin Union, Ida evoked the words of Terence McSweeney, who had died following a 74-day hunger strike in Brixton Prison in October 1920. It is not those who inflict the most who will prevail, but those who endure. In the course of my research in Kilmainham Jail, I came across another entry which grabbed my attention. It was the name Bridget Curran. Her address was listed as Main Street, Kalala. She had been in Kilmainham and North Dublin Union with her fellow North Mayo comrades, Ida and Maggie. I began, I began making inquiries, but there was no memory of Miss Curran in Kalala. Eventually, the trail led to Dublin, and I made contact with her grandson, Kevin. And I'd also like to add, I've also just met her granddaughter, Eileen, and her husband, who are here this evening. And it was just a remarkable experience to meet them. Um, and her grandson, Kevin. Bridie was as she was known, was a farmer's daughter from Banrobe, but she had moved to Clalla and took, took up employment as a seamstress. She joined the Clalla branch of Cumann and Man under the command of Elizabeth Nockney, Lockney during the War of Independence. Bridie was an active intelligence operative, and her home and workshop on Main Street were often raided by the Crown forces. During the Civil War, she carried dispatches all over the hinterland, raised funds for the IRA, and put her seamstress skills to good use by making clothes and haversacks for the local columns. On the night of 1st of April, 1923, Free State soldiers burst into Bridie's home to arrest her. Bridie gave a vivid written testimony of her experience to the Military Service Pensions Board. On 1st of April 1923, I was arrested in the dead of night in Kalala, taken to Balna and kept there for a week, then sent to Tume, and I was kept there for another week. I was badly abused by the military and pulled out one morning to see six of our men being shot into their graves, RIP. I was sent from Tume to Galway and from there to Kilmainham, where I was badly treated on one occasion, I narrowly escaped death. The six men shot into their graves were, of course, the men who had become known as the Tomb Martyrs, executed at 8 a.m. on the morning of 11th of April in the grounds of the former Tomb Workhouse. 
the youngest among them was 17-year-old Sean Maguire, teenage brother of Tom Maguire of Kong, TD for South Mayo and commander of the 4th Western Division of the Anti-Treaty IRA. It's almost impossible to grasp the impact of being forced to witness such an atrocity must certainly have had on Bridie. And the deeply traumatised state she must have been before she even set foot in Clemenum, where she joined the hunger strike and then on to the North Dublin Union. The occasion on which she says she narrowly escaped death must surely be a reference to the violent transfer from Kilmainham to the North Dublin Union. Bridie was released from Kilmainham, from Leshkill. Bridie was released from the North Dublin Union in August 1923 after TJ O'Connell, Labour TD for South Mayo, raised her case with Richard Mulcahy and Dahl Aaron, presumably following representations from her family. She returned to Kalala only to find that her workshop had been completely ransacked and destroyed. Interestingly, sorry, Interestingly, she married a Free State soldier. His name was Michael Healy, and he was from Behi Valley Castle, and I've just found out from Eileen that he potentially he was in the volunteers before he joined the Free State Army. And they actually met when she was a prisoner in Balna Barracks, but they may have known each other from before then. But in any event, when she was held in the barracks in Balna, he was there as one of her jailers. So that's an unusual way to meet someone. But um, Eileen tells me that he was tall, dark and handsome, and unfortunately, sometimes these things, you let them away with murder, uh, <laughs> where he was posted. Uh, Michael and Bridie moved to Dublin, where Michael was among the last batch of the old Dublin Metropolitan Police before they were absorbed into the Garda Tiocona. They raised eight children, and they lived on the north side of Dublin in Merino. Uh, Bridie never spoke about her past, and uh, her family, including her 94-year-old daughter, Una, um, had no idea of what she had endured. Um, they knew that her mother had been in prison, but aside from that, not a lot of details. And as recently as this week, they're only now starting to read her file and um, find out exactly what she witnessed and what she experienced. Um, I had the pleasure of making contact with her family and her grandson, Kevin, who made a comment about his beloved granny, which really struck a chord with me. And Kevin said just this week, he said, my grandmother never spoke about her past, but it seems now that after 100 years, she wants her voice to be heard. Bridie and Michael seem to have come to a mutual agreement and they didn't speak about politics, although tensions did flare usually around the time of a general election. <laughs> Bridie was a proud Mayo woman all her life and a keen musician, see her there on the box, and that is a talent that her grandson Kevin has inherited. And Kevin actually told me a story that he was playing music in Grange Gorman, um, the Technological University Dublin which is the site of the old NDU. And the date that he was playing the music, when he came home that evening, his cousin sent him a little page from an autograph book. And the date that was signed by Bridget Curran during her time in NDU was exactly 100 years to the day that he had played music. So, as he said, she definitely wants her voice to be heard. Um, it was not until October 1923, four months after the end of the Civil War, that Ida and Maggie were released from captivity. They were among the last of the female prisoners to let go, among a cohort deemed to be the most dangerous. They returned to their hometown, but continued to keep contact with and support their male counterparts, those who were on the run and those who were held in free state prison camps until 1924. Gradually, the process of beginning a new life in the new Stair Thought era began. In September 1924, sorry, Maggie married John Sweeney from Mullingar, who was living in Ballina, learning his trade as a butcher in Shamble Street. Interestingly, John was a relative of... Thomas and Christopher Hickey, killed by British soldiers in the North King Street Massacre of Easter 1916. Maggie and John set up a home and butcher shop in Austin Fire Street, Mullingar. They had one daughter, Maeve, who went into holy orders. She went on to become known as Sister Annunciata, and some of you may be familiar with her. She was matron of Swinford Hospital until 1990s. In 1971, she oversaw the building of a new extension to the hospital known as the Lilac Room. Uh, she blazed a trail in community health care by offering a daycare service for senior citizens, the first of its kind in all of Ireland, and she passed away in 2009. All who knew Sister Nunciata described her as a force of nature, and I like to think that at least some of that spirit must certainly have come from her mother, Maggie, from Knockanillon. In 1938, Ida mar married Martin J. McGrath, himself a veteran of the period, who had been a prisoner in Tintown Camp in the Curra, alongside comrades such as Pappy Coleman, Pappy Ford, Dennis Sheeran, Dr. Frank Ferran, to name but a few. He too had endured hunger strikes and the harsh treatment of ha at the hands of his comrades turned captors. Martin became heavily involved in local politics, serving on the Ballinat Town Council for two decades and as chairman of Mayo County Council for 10 consecutive years. 
in, he set up the, in 1946, he set up the Ballinar branch of Clan of Bublicta, hosting the party's enigmatic leader, Sean McBride, son of Maud Gan, um, in Ballina on numerous occasions. Martin unsuccessfully contested the 1952 general election on behalf of the clan before returning to politics as a local an independent candidate. He and Ida were opposites in many ways. She was very quiet and reserved. Martin was known for his outgoing and colourful personality and he was one of the best known public service in, servants in the county and at one time he held the record for the amount of committees and boards that he was a member of. So he was always on the go. Um, Ida and Martin operated a newsagent shop on Upper Pier Street in premises that was later McGonagall's chemist, some of you will remember as being the most narrow shop in the town. Martin entered the auctioneering business in 1951 and Ida held the position of old age pensions clerk for the county for many consecutive years. In later years, Ida was a familiar sight to passers-by going about their business in Pier Street, formerly Knox Street, a street, which had, a street which had been the constant backdrop to so much of her fascinating life. Local men, Tom and Paddy, recall their memories of Ida in her twilight years, in her home on the lower end of Pier Street, near the site of Balna's tourist office. Both of these men worked as messenger boys in their youth. Paddy worked for Gavin's and Tom was employed by Lowry's. Both remember Ida sitting on a chair inside the window. The bottom half was always lifted up and she'd be watching the world go by. Paddy says she would nab you to do a few little messages up the town. And Tom says she would have a little chat and she'd always give you a good tip. Both men called to mind a small, kindly woman who seemed much older in years than she really was. No doubt the hardships, hardships endured in previous decades had really taken their toll on Ida. And Paddy is, of course, some of you may know, my good friend, fountain of knowledge, gentleman, Paddy Gorman. And Tom is also my good friend, a gentleman, a fountain of knowledge, my first teacher, my best teacher, and my dear old dad. <laughs> and just to go back to what Liam was saying about asking stories, and I might not be sitting on his knee, but if I ask a question, he'll give me the answer. And himself and Paddy are my two best sources of anything to do with local history, and I'm very thankful to them both. And just to embarrass them further, here's a nice picture of the two of them together in the 1960s on Lord Edward Street. So local history is alive and well. Um, okay, where am I now? That's Tom and Paddy. Okay. Ida Hora died in St. Joseph's Hospital on the 11th of August 1966. She was supposed to go to Knock Shrine that day, but unfortunately she passed away. It was the year which marked the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. Balna commemorates the occasion with a large procession and the unveiling of a new memorial at the Republican plot in League Cemetery, unveiled by Tom Maguire. I wonder, what did Ida make of it all? Had the Ireland that she had risked her life for been achieved? And what would she say of Ireland in 2023? Her funeral at St. Muir's Cathedral drew large crowds. Full military honours were given. The tricolour which draped her coffin was the one which had been used at the funeral of Maud Gone 13 years previously. The grave adoration was given by her friend and comrade of old, Phelan Pillery, who remarked, there will never be another fighting lady like dear old Ida. The stories of Maggie, Ida and Bridie are just a snapshot of so many of the local brave women of this area, all of whom deserve to have their stories told. And I'm just going to mention a few, and I wish I had time to mention them all because they all do deserve it. Um, thank you to Frank, who's here for the photograph. Um, of his grandmother, sisters Julia and Mary Walsh, whose home in Quignaleca was constantly used as a dispatch centre and safe house for the North Mayo and West Sligo brigades. Julia worked as a typist in the British Ministry of Pensions Office in Ballina. She practically led a double life, typing dispatches for the IRA in a back room in the office late at night and having a key cut so that she could let herself in and hide weapons in the building all throughout the town war and civil war. She was almost caught on several occasions, but she never ceased in her activities. She married Frank McElwee and she lived to see her 101st birthday in their home on Howley Terrace where they raised a beautiful family. Her sister Mary Walsh, who went on to marry soldier turned statesman and Senator for Fianna Fáil, Tom Ruan, who our town park is named after. Um, she took consignments of rifles that had been sent from Dublin and she hid them under the floorboards in JJ Murphy's shop where she was employed and her boss never suspected a thing. She cycled all over the area on the bike carrying dispatches, weapons 
and her service really, like Julius, is immeasurable. And as I said, she went on to marry Senator Tan Ruma, and there they are at their son's, or at their son's wedding. Um, Josephine Hanahoe from Rathcash, whose employment at the Central Hotel allowed her to gather intelligence of the movements from the Free State soldiers built it there, which she then passed along to the IRA. Mary Ann Morrison from Rehens, captain of that branch, who ferried men on their own to safety in a rowboat across a stretch of the Moy that ran by her house. Her house was a constant place of refuge throughout the whole period, where men on their men run would go for food, shelter, and to be taken care of um, on the far side of the Moy. So many women, um, so many stories untold, and so many unsung heroes, and we haven't even talked about the countless ordinary residents of our town whose lives were so deeply affected by this period of our history in so many ways. There are no plaques for the women of Cumann Man and Ballina. There are no streets which bear their names. There's no memorial to mark the spot where poor Constance Tynan gave her young life for a conflict in which she had no part. I hope that someday this will change. But for now, we can honour our forgotten women in the simple act of speaking their names and remembering them. And I would like to thank you all for allowing me to do just that this evening. For me, Mark Clear. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nate.